Yes, good morning and warm welcome to today's webinar in which we will talk about expansion Southeast Asia. Today we will give you a first overview what it ma makes what makes Southeast Asia so interesting as an expansion market. We will also share some insights and advice that were given to us during the study we have performed on Scandinavian SMEs established in this region. But before we start uh, this presentation, we want to introduce ourselves. Uh, as you can see, Apples and Spears is the center, and we are market entry consultancy, uh, helping small and medium-sized companies, startups, and social entrepreneurs to evaluate the market potential here in Southeast Asia. And we, behind Apples and Spears, are Sandra Appelqvist to the left on the picture, and I am Agneta Spute to the right. And we are present here in Singapore and have a great network of local partners throughout the region. This presentation will take approximately 30 minutes. Uh, the webinar is in listening mode only. So if and when you have questions, you can write them directly into the chat or you can email us. Uh, we will answer your questions individually after the webinar. So today we will, after a short intro, give you a first overview of Southeast Asia as expansion market, as I said, and tell, tell you about our study of Scandinavian SMEs established in the region and share the advice given by them. Uh, and finally, we will present a checklist and end with a short summary. We will start this webinar today by showing some important growth figures which demonstrates the dramatic change taking place in Southeast Asia in the year. Asia has today an estimated growth rate that is three times higher than that of the Western world. It's the world's fifth largest economy predicted to become the fourth largest by 2050. The middle class will rise with a whopping 110% up until year 2020. E-commerce in the area is expected to grow with up to 30% yearly, and over $7 trillion are estimated to be needed in direct investments in order to meet the expected growth rate in the region. These key figures show in broad terms that Southeast Asia has a huge potential and growth development rate. But at the same time, we can see that only 1.5% of Swedish exports today goes to this part of the world. Too few SMEs are doing business outside of Sweden, despite the fact that it's becoming easier to do business across borders today. Swedish export is predominantly focused on countries within the European Union. We have a tendency to do business with nations which are somewhat familiar with and that are closer to us despite the fact that the highest growth potentials are in fact outside the European Union borders. And we will show you today that Southeast Asia is one such area that Swedish companies should keep an eye on in order to stay competitive. This is the Global Innovation Index created by Bloomberg, listing the top 100 innovative countries in the world. Sweden is ranked as the seventh leading country in the world with an outstanding performance within areas such as research and development, innovation, production and high-end technology. We have a fantastic international reputation that provides Swedish companies with a great platform from where to kickstart international establishments and to build business in other parts of the world. There is so much more that can be done outside of our own country and that is why we think it's important to provide an understanding to the potentials in Southeast Asia, where Swedish services and innovation is highly important and needed. So let's start with the overview uh, and a map of the region, Southeast Asia. Uh, Southeast Asia consists of 11 countries with nearly 640 million people living here. 10 out of these 11 countries in the region have formed an economic cooperation called ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, that is a sort of a free trade area agreement. It's only the little young country, Timor-Leste, down here um, on the right, that is currently outside the ASEAN community, uh, but 
it's just because they have not yet uh, fulfilled the member criteria, but they will uh, eventually join too. The main purpose of this economic uh, union, ASEAN, is to create a free flow of products, services and labour between member states. The final agreement is planned to be in full swing by the end of December this year, 2015. Uh, but already now, the main trade barriers like tariffs and fees are more or less gone for products and goods. Southeast Asia, or ASEAN, is not a homogeneous region, as you understand. Instead, the spread between the countries is quite big. Take the difference in population, for example. Sing uh, Indonesia here, for example, with 254 million inhabitants, and compared with Brunei, that is just short of half a million people. And if you look at the BMP per capita, or GDP per capita, Singapore has $62,000 per capita, and compared with the BMP per capita, for Myanmar, which is $1,700. Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia and Vietnam uh, belong to the younger economies in this region, where the markets are still relatively immature and with lower economy, uh, economic uh, activity, but where it's expected to happen a lot in the future, so that companies entering these markets early will be able to position themselves well before the expected competition arrives. And the real, so to speak, uh, emerging markets in the region is Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand and Philippines. Uh, these are economies that have reached a bit further already. They have had and are expected to continue having a steady, healthy growth. They have also a more regulated and adjusted business climate. And then we have this little Singapore, the city-state with no more than 5.4 million inhabitants. It distinguished itself by having turned into a well-established, stable economy with one of the highest GDP per capita in the world in, in only 50 years. This state was only founded in uh, 1965, actually. Uh, here we can see that Southeast Asia's population of 640 million puts the region in the third place in the world after China and India, and is thereby bigger both than European Union, USA and Japan. And as we said, Southeast Asia is the fifth biggest economic region in the world, and it, it has a total GDP that is 25% bigger, bigger than India's. The global digital transformation is revolutionizing market economies and will have a strong impact on the way we do business today and in the future. This is something that is particularly true for Southeast Asia, where digital development is growing more rapidly than anywhere else in the world today. We will take a closer look at this. Apart from Singapore, which is one of the world's highest ranking countries in terms of digital development, Majority of the countries belonging to Southeast Asia has, in comparison, relatively lower levels of internet penetration, adaption and innovation. But this is changing rapidly. There is an enormous growth happening in the whole region. The internet population, as an example, grew with 16% yearly between 2008 and 2013. To give you a sense of the extreme development in the less mature and newly open market economies, we have Myanmar as an example, where the internet population grew four times bigger in just one year, between 2014 and 2015. This is the Digital Evolution Index, showcasing levels of digital growth in the world between 2008 and 2013. Digital development was studied and compared between different countries and placed in comparison to how well these countries supported and handled development in terms of infrastructure, new technology, innovative environment, rules and regulations. What is very interesting to take note of here is that the majority of the Southeast Asian countries are placed in what is called the breakout category. In short terms, this indicates that these countries have shown a huge potential to develop strong digital economies and have demonstrated high levels of tremendous rapid growth over the years. 
Singapore, as you can see, is ranked as a standout country for high performance in digital and technical developments. The Singaporean politicians have set ambitious goals to develop Singapore into what they call a smart nation with digital services and technology that will support everything from healthcare, education, infrastructure and communications. But for the majority of countries in Southeast Asia, there is still a big need to enhance and further develop the digital infrastructure and for governments to support the growth that is happening in these countries, such as Vietnam, Indonesia and the Philippines. If that succeeds, which everything indicates, we will see that these markets will leapfrog several stages in the development process. As an example, we have people living in rural areas of these countries that today have no access whatsoever to physical commerce and retail. These people will, within a short time frame, be able to access e-commerce through their mobile phones. This drastic digital shift taking place will have an enormous effect on the continued growth in Southeast Asia. And there are great opportunities for Swedish innovation companies to be part of these developments. Another factor distinguishing Southeast Asia is the fast-growing middle class. There are a number of different definitions on what middle class really is, but in principle they all mean that when people reach an income level which gives them the opportunity to purchase more than it's just absolutely necessary for survival, then they enter the middle class. In Southeast Asia, the middle class will more than double from 190 million people to 400 million people by 2020, according to Nielsen's estimation. An, an increasing middle class in emerging markets is interesting in several aspects. When a big group of people suddenly can afford to spend money on other than the most essential for the first time, a huge consumption market is opened. By being present early in the market, companies and brands can secure a position before remaining competitors enter. The growing middle class, private consumption, contribute positively to the economic, economic development of the country and by generating future well-educated inhabitants. This because the middle class tend to spend their extra money on education. And thirdly, with the growing middle class comes a shift from barter trade and concealed economy towards a more open economy which generates more tax income to the country. But it's actually not only about money. An important part of the identity for people entering the middle class is the aspiration and dreams about a better life and a better future with everything that that implies. Education, travel, entertainment, clothes, music and even entrepreneurship and so on. This also puts another type of pressure on the society as a whole. We can see the growing middle class as a consequence of and an engine for the entire economy. Societies with strong growth demands access to clean water, sanitation, access to energy, functional infrastructure for transport, digital infrastructure and development, better housing, reliable house, uh, health care and not the least good education. For the entire Southeast Asia, McKinsey estimates that investments of seven trillion dollars are needed until 2030 for all these societal development areas to support the expected high growth in the region. This is money that will need to come from governments, organization, private investments and capital markets in different ways. But that is not enough. New ideas, new ways of working and new innovations are needed to support this development. This is where Swedish innovation is essential and highly needed. It is in these development areas where business opportunities with great potential are to be found. For an overall view of the Southeast Asian region, we believe it's important to include a brief description of the cultural differences between Asia and Sweden. Southeast Asia is a multicultural area and is highly fragmented, just like Europe, with many different religions and spoken languages. But what is good to be aware of is that there are a number of business cultures that dominate more than others, and that is especially the Chinese business culture. 
Amongst five biggest Southeast Asian economies, which are Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand and the Philippines, a total of 60% of the private industry capital is owned by the region 6% Chinese, which are also the ones controlling the majority of the trading in the region. This is Ingelhart Weltzel's cultural map. It shows in broad terms how countries in the world relate to each other from a cultural perspective. It visualizes in a simple way how Sweden and Swedish culture compare with the Southeast Asian cultures. Sweden is unique with its high levels of liberalism as well as high levels of tolerance toward foreign cultures and gender equality. The Southeast Asian countries are, in comparison to Sweden, closer positioned to values where religion, strong family ties and authority are important. These cultures do also have a higher degree of financial safety and security, and with lower levels of trust and tolerance to foreign cultures. Relationship and trust building are, in other words, built in completely different ways than that we are used to in Sweden. So what are some of the characteristic differences between our cultures? To begin with, the Asian cultures are collectivistic in comparison to the Swedish culture, which is one of the world's most individualistic ones. In Asia, group values rank high. Having strong ties to community, group and family is highly prioritized. In Sweden, on the contrary, we value individual freedom and personal goals much stronger. Asian culture is safety and security grounded, which in turn affects risk taking. If an individual makes a mistake, it not only affects the individual himself, but also the group, the company and the family that he or she belongs to. Failure is translated to feelings of shame. In Sweden, we take failure less serious in comparison. Failure is seen as a part of the learning curve, and so we also tend to take higher risks, relatively speaking. In Asia, the communication style is indirect. You don't necessarily say directly what you mean, but rather you're expected to be able to, be, to read between the lines. Asians want to a higher degree avoid losing face in front of the group, nor do they want to make other people lose their face in group situations. Problems are not necessarily ventilated openly in meetings, but the preferred way to open and to open up is in private one-to-one -one discussion. In Sweden, in comparison to Asia, we tend to be more direct in our communication style. We are more open with how we feel and we share more openly what we think, even with people whom we don't know well. In Asia, it's important to know how to build relationships, as Asian cultures are highly relationship-led. To gain trust and to be seen as a reliable business partner, you need to spend enough time to get to know your potential client before you can start to talk about business. In Sweden, on the other hand, we jump into business matters far quicker and our client relations are more goal-oriented rather than depending on strong relationship ties. And finally, the obvious but not less important to mention is that Asian businesses are built on hierarchies and where authority and clear roles of responsibility is the norm. This is something worth keeping in mind for Swedish business professionals who are more used to extremely flat organizations where the boss is often a natural part of the team. This is seen as unusual in Asia. So we will now present our study where we have interviewed Scandinavian SMEs with a presence in Southeast Asia. We will share their practical recommendations and insights in regards to what you should consider prior to market entry in this part of the world. <clears throat> We've interviewed 30 Scandinavian SMEs in total. These companies belong to eight different industries and have a presence in seven out of Southeast Asia's 11 countries. The questions we asked centered around the company's main challenges during the establishment process. We then had a discussion around what insights they gained throughout the process and finally how they tackle their challenges. And here are some of the companies that uh, we've interviewed. The companies 
that we interviewed shared lots of stories with us. But in order to make this presentation as straightforward as possible, we've summarized the most important and frequently shared recommendations and insights into five different categories. And these are business climate, preparations, headquarter relations and time aspect, build presence and sales, and recruitment and human relations. Business climate. Well, the companies we interviewed were all very clear about the importance of understanding the differences between doing business at home and doing business in Southeast Asia. They really pushed the importance of awareness of that cultural differences are there and will influence not only how you are perceived and seen, but also how you perceive and understand your partners, customers and employees. The same goes for the leadership and how it's performed and perceived. Several of our companies have shared how they were consistently going with their Swedish goal-oriented management style, giving a lot of responsibilities to the employees and trusted that they would get immediate direct feedback on issues. It turned out to be less successful, so their advice was to use a much more direct and directing management style, at least initially. Uh, to be very open about the long-term commitment and clearly state that the company has patience and perseverance to stay put at the market is a very good starting point for building the important relationships with both customers, partners and employees. What also came up was the fact that every single country in this region has its own uh, local regulatory framework and ways of doing business. Expect that this will impact your timetable in different ways. Build this into your plans already from the start to avoid unwanted surprises. Corruption is present in several markets and if you want to avoid this and keep a zero tolerance as a Swedish business, you can, but it demands patience in time and fi financial stamina to let the process work its way without any interference. So please plan for this as well. We also got a lot of advice around the preparatory work before entering a new market here in Southeast Asia. Something that we occurred several times was the need of understanding for real your market, your target groups and their needs. The main input was that it's not enough to prepare only from home. To be present here in the region while you're doing that is preferable. Several of our companies had said that they were really making nice, well-written business plans at home, but once they were here, they had to discard them and start over because their original plans were not anchored enough in the reality here of the Southeast Asian. By, uh, by really see the local competition and the real needs and from there estimate the potential, you know what you're getting yourself into, both to plan time and resources needed as well as setting the expectations on the right level from the start. As we said, Southeast Asia is a very heterogeneous market, so instead of one overall plan for the whole region, make sure to localize the business plans to each specific country you are considering. And finally, be prepared that things happen fast here and unexpected, so plan for flexibility and be prepared for quick adaption. In this category, their relationship to the headquarters and the time aspect, the companies share with us how important and helpful it is to have an active and engaged management in the home country and that supports you in the setup in the new market. Financial resources and enough given time is needed to have a reasonable and realistic chance to succeed with the establishment. Provide the person who is sent to set up the new office with good support and backup. It's not very uncommon to feel detached from the head office and with a burden of high expectations to succeed in a short period of time. Do plan for this transition. Make sure that the person in charge in the foreign country has a local senior mentor in order to understand the market from the inside at an early stage. This will ease the transition. A new market entry takes time. Do expect at least two to three years as a minimum before you will see results on your sales and marketing efforts. Have a flexibility for local market adaptations. Innovation, supply, price and cost structures will most likely be affected. So spend enough time to see how you can best adapt to, to your market needs. 
To embrace local innovation and to work close to the market where you are can be key to success. Several of the companies we've interviewed explained that they got stuck initially by trying to churn existing packages and products and services that sold well in the home country. They felt a need to adapt and change and were forced to think in new ways, which in turn created new solutions and business ideas that sparked the sales. Surprisingly, not only in the new market, but also back in Sweden, where they initially met a resistance to change existing concepts. So dare to change in order to meet specific market needs. It may change how the company operates on a global level. And finally, let go of the control from the headquarters over time. Give ample time and support initially. Embrace willingness to change and adapt, but make sure to plan for a setup of a self-sufficient and local office in the new market with local employees who know and understand their market. In the category of build a presence and sales, the companies stress the importance of a physical presence in the market where you want to grow your business in order to really be able to build strong ties with the clients. Again, Asian companies are highly relationship-led so it's important to invest your time to engage with people with whom you wish to do business and to show that you are genuinely interested in who they are and what they do before you jump into business conversations. You should clearly demonstrate that you are in the market to stay and make a long-term commitment. Marketing and PR are of course crucial components when you build a presence, but have in mind that your marketing communication may need to be adapted to the local market. We spoke to a company in the security industry and they explained to us how they spent big marketing budgets to try and sell their products in Malaysia. The core marketing message, which did well in Sweden, was how their products could save human lives. This did not seem to gain traction in, at, uh, at all in Malaysia. After several trials and after speaking with local customers, they finally understood that what was more important for Malaysians was rather how they could help them minimize property damage. <clears throat> talk, of, <clears throat> talk about different perceptions. The company finally adapted their marketing message and that had a clear direct effect in their sales results. One way to build a presence in Southeast Asia, and especially in the emerging markets such as Myanmar, Vietnam and Cambodia, is to go through distributors and resellers, as they know their market well, and since these markets also have their challenges. But do keep in mind to plan for how you establish contracts. Avoid exclusivity and make sure that you build in an exit strategy in the contract, in case the relationship is not working as expected. Singapore has been ranked as one of the best countries in the world to set up a company in. It has one of the highest non-corrupt and transparent economies and welcomes foreign investments. It therefore provides a stable ground where to start your expansion from in the Southeast Asian region. Many of the companies we interviewed chose to start in Singapore and have from there expanded into other countries over time in their, uh, on their own or through distributors and local partners. But if your company is looking for cost-effective production solutions, Singapore may not be the best option. It's worth looking to the neighboring countries. Even China has become an expensive uh, and more expensive as a producer in comparison to several of the countries in Southeast Asia. So the category recruitment and local talent, uh, several mentioned the smart move to select a local head for the company, both to emphasize the local anchoring and the long-term commitment, and also to profit from this person's local network and knowledge of the market. Also, to quickly employ local staff is sometimes a condition from the authorities, but also a success factor, both for anchoring the business locally and to level the cost structure of the company to the local competition. Meritocracy is present in many of the Southeast Asian countries, meaning that grades and papers from high-level schools and institutions means everything. This means also that the CVs that you will see will easily enchant you. 
the advice was here to try looking behind the surface and hire people with the right attitude and drive instead and the same value base as you and your company. This, it is so much easier to teach knowledge than to create right attitude, attitude and drive. On this note, it is also vital to create a smooth and efficient process for knowledge transfer uh, from the company to the employees, both to make sure that they are quickly on track to become profitable, as well as to strengthen the relations and thereby the loyalty of the staff. It can be quite tough for a small and unknown SME to attract and keep the desired competence in a region where multinational with big brands, they are seen as preferred employers. Uh, but several of the companies that we spoke to mentioned the need of building a strong internal business culture and philosophy based on the uniqueness of your specific company. In this internal foundation, along with building strong relationships with the staff, has been the recipe for attracting and keeping employees for several of our companies. As a compilation of all the advice, recommendation and input we've received from the companies, we have created a short but sweet checklist that can be used as a guide for you when you want to enter the, this market. Uh, we divide this checklist into three phases and a fourth dimension that will be present all along the process. So this is the checklist. The first part is scan. Scan your market to understand, evaluate the potential, and then decide if to enter or not. Plan for a market entry by deciding on own sales office, distributor, or agent. Uh, plan for creating contact, contacts and building relationships with partners of potential clients, and the admin needed to start working in the market. And then do, create, recruit the personnel, start marketing and sales processes, and develop your business. And parallel to this, during all three phases, you will ensure to learn about the business climate and culture and try to understand how it impacts you and your business in your specific industry. We at Apples and Spears we work with all these three areas. Firstly, we can help you in the initial phase and locally scan the market for you and prepare the basis for your decision to enter. We also have we, we also help with many of the practical parts during the planning and the implementation phase, together with our great local partners here in our network. We've almost reached the end of the webinar and we'll now summarize what we presented today. Let's have a quick look at these key figures again to remind ourselves of the big changes and transformations taking place in Southeast Asia now and in the future to come and why the market is in need for smart and sustainable innovations from the West. Growth is three times higher than that of the West. Southeast Asia is the fifth largest economy in the world, aiming to become the fourth biggest by 2050. The middle class with higher disposable income is on the rise with 110% up to 2020. E-commerce is expected to grow with up to 30% in the years to come and $7 trillion will be needed in direct investments in order to meet the expected growth rate. This all in all translates to huge potentials for Swedish companies and innovations to join in the future Southeast Asian development plans. The growth is there, the potential is there, you learn the business climate, the checklist for today we hope help you and we hope that this webinar has inspired you to go for it and uh, we welcome you to Southeast Asia. And by that we would like to thank you all for your time today with us and hope that you have received valuable insights and recommendations. Feel free to reach out with any questions or comments you may have, and we will do our best to answer these individually by email. Bye for now. Bye for now. Have a nice day.